So we'll kick off with our presentation um, on mass casualty triage in emergency department. So first, we'll go through some of the abbreviations that you may encounter along the way during the presentation. You have uh, uh, MCI, which in this, uh, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, will be mass casualty incident and EU will be emergency units. So the objectives of this uh, session, um, we're just going to have a brief uh, overview of our daily ED challenges, even outside our mass casualty incidents, definition of some uh, critical terms which we encountered during the presentation. And now we'll go into the MCA triage. We'll go through the different triage um, categories uh, during a mass casualty incident and the triage tools that are used worldwide. So some of the ED challenges that occur uh, in our various EDs, even despite uh, in a normal day, you encounter overcrowding, um, you have physicians and nurses shortages, uh, space con constraint, and also um, having to deal with non-emergency patients. So imagine having this on a normal day, and then on, on top of that, you get a mass casualty incident where you have uh, a big crowd of people coming into your ED, despite you having these existing challenges. So some of the terms that you're going to go through is a mass casualty, what, it, or what a mass casualty incident means. And this is an incident where the number of live uh, patients exceeds the amount of healthcare resources available. So resources in this case uh, entails your staff, your materials in staff in, in terms of staff that you you'd use to manage these patients, and uh, yeah, and space as I had said. So this number uh, varies widely across the countries, but most of the time, if you get more than ten critical patients at any point in time, so this may warrant to be called a mass casualty incident. So triage, uh, as we have, was earlier alluded in earlier presentations, it just basically means to sort. So uh, so the current practice as it is uh, for day-to-day -day, uh, uh, emergencies. So for triage, what is the aim of triage during our day-to-day -day, uh, emergencies? So the aim is actually to do um, good for each individual patient. So every day in our ED. So the focus is on every patient that comes to your ED. Uh, but now for a mass casualty incident, the aim is to do um, the greatest good for those who can um, most benefit from medical interventions. So for a mass casualty incident, um, you mostly focus on your red patients, those who need, um, who are emergent, who need uh, care here and now. Um, yeah, so that you can, they can get, uh, you can save as many people as you can. So we'll go through and see who are these red patients uh, along the presentation. So for large scale disasters, uh, triage, uh, the purpose is to do the greatest good for the greatest number of potential survivors. So for large scale disasters, your focus will mainly be on your yellow and green patients. That is, uh, those who are not very critically uh, injured. Uh, so with minor or moderate injuries mm -hmm. and where you can, uh, they don't need as much resources as your red patients. So in an MCI triage, uh, so as you say, this will differ from your daily triage where the aim of daily triage is where you want to do the best good uh, yeah, good for all the patients who come to your department. But for this, you know, you, your aim is to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Those are your red patients. So during an MCA triage, um, it adopts a, a simplified utilitarian approach that is uh, an approach that is more useful as opposed to attractive in order to maximize the impact of limited resources on patient outcomes. And then irrespective of the triage tool employed, you have two stages uh, to the process of triage. You have uh, step one and step two. So what do you mean by step one? So for step one um, triage, it's based on either you're working or you're working patients or those who are not working. So this should be based on the non-working status to identify 
those who would benefit from immediate medical intervention and to facilitate your step two triage. So uh, in this category, you, you start with the um, up there, you have, is the patient working? Are they not working? So if they're, if they're working, then you direct them um, to non-emergent um, area uh, where you say um, for delayed treatment, they can wait a bit longer uh, as opposed to those who are not working. So it is important to remember that working patients sometimes may have severe life-threatening injuries that can develop over time. And that's hence the reason for secondary triage when they go to that um, the, the designated area for the non-serious cases. So therefore, step two triage and repeated reassessment is vital to monitor patients for deterioration. So al although clinical experience is an advantage uh, in some situations where resources are limited or where the cultural context allows, even unhealthcare healthcare workers could be trained to perform step one triage. So as we have said, step one triage is where you just want to identify patients if they are working or not. For step two tri triage, so after step one, uh, step two triage uh, is subsequently performed on all patients, even the those one you have triaged as working and these non-working patients. Um, and you, you must always remember that in an MCI, even in normal cases, um, triage should be considered a continuous and dynamic process. So the status of the patient the clinical status may change at any point. And it's only when you do a uh, continuous triage that you will notice these changes. If you don't, you might actually miss on these patients. So for those patients who are in the red zone, those who are the non-working patients, uh, step two triage happens after resuscitation of the patient. Um, so it requires advanced clinical knowledge and competencies and therefore should be performed by uh, qualified clinicians who will be able to differentiate uh, this patient and be able to pick up those emergency signs for the patients to be managed uh, accordingly and appropriately. So in the green zone, see, these are the working patients, those patients who came in working, and you directed them to a certain region to wait uh, for their turn in treatment. So they're not emergency, they can uh, wait. So patients should be retriaged using the standard day-to-day -day triage tool used at the facility that you're practicing. I hope that's clear so far. So we go on to where do we perform triage in an MCI? So we know in our normal setup, in our normal EDs, triage is within the ED department. It's one. Uh, basically one of the rooms or uh, two rooms that are dedicated for that. So, but in an MCI, in a, uh, so in a non-MCI uh, setting, it, it is performed inside that ED unit. So, but during an MCI, the exact location of the triage point may vary among different health facilities, though there are general principles that should be applied in allocating the triage points. So these principles should include the designation of step one triage point, uh, external and adjacent to the emergency unit entrance in an area that can be safe and secure during an event. So remember, we said step one triage, this is when you're just sorting the patients, the walking and then non-walking patients. So it should be outside the emergency department where you, the actual treatment of the patients will take place but you should, you should not be so far from the emergency um, room entrance so that it doesn't take a while to transport now your red or the emergency patients to the emergency room. So a good practice, a third point should be clearly marked and define boundaries. We should connect it to the emergency unit entrance to ensure an easily identifiable pathway. So yeah, for you, now for the stage one, make sure it's just outside the emergency room where you just sort you green, uh, sorry, you're working and those patients who are not working. And then after you identify the patients who are not working, you can easily and quickly transfer them to the emergency room. You have uh, typical mass casualty triage categories 
uh, this is uh, acceptable worldwide. So um, for the minimum, uh, where these are the patients who we triage as uh, the green categories. These are, they are, they are sick or injured, but they're expected to survive with or without care. So sometimes they're referred as the walking wounded. Those are your non-emergent uh, patients, those who can wait a bit longer. And then for your delayed patients, those are the yellow category. So they require, they require care, uh, but can be safe, safely delayed without affecting probability of survival. And then now moving on to the to your red categories, those are you, the patients who require immediate care. Mm -hmm. So these patients require immediate care for a good probability of survival. So these are the ones you actually, in an MCI, these are the ones you concentrate mostly on. So we have a, another category that's your, sometimes the, given a blue tag, uh, they're called the expectant. So they are, they are alive, but with li little or no chance of survival, uh, given the current available resources. So, and most of the injuries, uh, they're not compatible with life. So these ones you don't take, uh, as long as you don't have enough resources, uh, we don't take much time on them. And then now you have your disease. This is a fatality, and uh, they, ha they have no intrinsic respiratory drive or no other signs of life. So these ones, you tag them as black, or in uh, some other countries, they may be tagged as uh, gray. So we have uh, triage tags. Uh, so these are international acceptable, uh, but uh, sometimes you may not have this in your facilities, but you can always... Uh, uh, be innovative. You can use uh, bands with different color codes. You can use uh, papers and uh, you can use even marker pens to mark the patients uh, when they come in. But yeah, these are international, international acceptable. So you, as you can see how they are, how they are uh, labeled. So you have uh, the deceased, the immediate delayed and minor. So let's say a, pas a patient comes in, um, they're walking. So those will treat them as uh, the minor category, that's the walking wounded. So they go on with the whole tag. So, and then, uh, but for your yellow patients, you'll remove the, normally uh, the triage tag as it is, uh, you can actually cut uh, the areas, uh, the other color codes if the patient does not meet that criteria. So let's say your patient is uh, a red tapped patient. So in these uh, triage tags, you're actually able to cut both, um, now to eliminate both your yellow and the green tag areas. So this also helps, this tags also helps during the triage. Let's say your patient came in as a green patient, that's your minor category. And then uh, during the triage, you actually notice uh, they are yellow patients, so you can always cut cut out the green area, and then now they they remain as a yellow category. So we'll go through some of the triage tools that are used. You have start triage, that's simple triage and rapid assessment, um, mostly used for the adult patients. That's adults in this in an MCI is considered above eight years of age. And then jumpstart, these are your pediatric patients between one and eight years. Um, then you have SOL, save, uh, pediatric triage tape, and save, which is secondary assessment or victim endpoint. And then you'll also uh, mention on those patients who are exposed to CBRN, that's your chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear um, mass casualty triage system. So we'll start on with our triage with our start. That's that stands for simple triage and rapid assessment. So this is a tool that was developed in uh, 1983 by staff at uh, Home Hospital and Info Beach Fire De Department in California, mostly for rescuers with bas basic first aid skills. So that should tell you that it's quite a relatively easy tool to use. Then the triage colors uh, may be assigned by giving either the triage tags, as I had uh, earlier 
explained and uh, indicated to patients or simply by physically sorting patients into different designated areas. So that depends with your hospital and uh, how you have planned your ED in case of an MCI. So this is the algorithm for the SAR triage. So as I said, um, so most of these uh, triage tools, they have those two steps. So the step one is identifying um, whether these patients are working or not. And then now the step two will go deeper into the non-working and also the working patients to identify probably the individual injuries that this patient have. So you start with a patient and you observe them. Are they able to walk? If they're able to walk, then these are minor patients. And now you redirect or they'll be redirected to the green zone or the minor zone where a secondary triage will take place. So if these patients are not able to walk, you assess for their breathing. So if they're not able to breathe, um, so the first thing you try to position their airway. Uh, so head tilt, chin lift, uh, to try and see uh, if they're able to breathe. So if they're able to breathe, then these are your immediate uh, patients. They need immediate care. Those are your red patients. You tag them red and uh, you ensure that uh, they receive care here and now. As you can see, they're not able to maintain their airway. So anytime if the airway is still compromised, they may end up dying. Uh, so if you position the airway and still they're not breathing, then those are your expectants or your black patients. So this one you will transfer them to the designated areas for where you receive or put your black patients. So you don't do uh, much for these patients in terms of uh, giving resources. We've gone through, so those, those ones, uh, we've gone through the, uh, the airway, the ability to breathe on their own. So if they're not, uh, if they're breathing normally, you further go to assess their respiratory rate. So for the SAT triage, um, you use uh, the respir respirate of uh, 30, that is a cutoff. So for those with uh, respirate above 30, those are also tagged uh, red patients. So they may have, uh, they have a compromised uh, breathing like uh, respiratory. These are patients who potentially could have uh, pneumothorax, pneumothorax and all that. So they need immediate care and intervention. So you go on to respirate, but they are breathing uh, and the rate is less than 30. You go on to assess the perfusion. So for this, you assess the, the radio pulse and also the cap refill. So if you find that they, they don't have a radio pulse or the cap refill is more than two seconds, you tag them as red. So potentially these are patients who are in shock, so they need to be um, managed immediately. So if they have a pulse, you have a radio pulse and the cap refill is less than 10 seconds, you go on to assess the mental status. Um, so basically, you find out if they're able to uh, obey commands. They are, like you can tell them to open their eyes, to lift up their uh, their hand. So if they're not able to obey commands, then those are your images, uh, your red patients. So they need immediate care. But if they not, if they are able to obey commands, then they go on to the delayed category. Those are your yellow patients. So they can wait a bit longer. Uh, once you finish with the red patients, you can always come to the yellow patients. So that's about it for the start triage. So for the jump start, this is a it's it's a start triage, but now it's it's like a start triage, but it's for the pediatric population that is um, eight years and below. So there are some few differences between the start and the jump start triage. So the differences um, in this algorithm include uh, now for your pediatric patients. So after opening the airway, after uh, realizing the adult breathing, there's that uh, provision of giving five rescue breaths, those who are apneic, but with a pulse. Then they are given, if they don't have uh, uh, they're not breathing even after the five rescue breaths, then you can confidently tag them as black. And then uh, the normal respirate for these uh, patients in this category who use this uh, jump start, that's 
below eight years. Uh, we use more than 15 or less than 45. Remember for the start, the rate was uh, flat 30. But for now, for the jump start, you have, uh, uh, you check if the rate is less than 15 or less than 45. And then now for the neurological assessment, you do it using the AVP. Um, so AVP is a mnemonic. So A stands for are they alert? V is response to verbal stimuli. P is response to painful stimuli. And D is unresponsive. So any patient who has uh, abnormal posturing to painful stimuli or is unresponsive, these patients will get a red tag. So this is the algorithm for the jump start triage. So this, as I said, it's a modification to the start system and takes into account the difference in the normal respiratory rate for children. So it acts to assess pediatric patients better and the age cutoff, as I had said, is uh, eight years and below. But if you're not able to ascertain a child's age, you can always uh, assess the underarm for any hair in males or breast development in females as an indicator of adult age or exclusion from this cohort. The algorithm, uh, yeah, so as we say, the step one, you assess if they are able to walk. Um, so if they are able to walk, uh, they go to the minor, minor triage, uh, the minor region, that's your green patients, and where secondary triage will take place. So, but for this, you have to, to be cognizant of the fact that we have infants in this category. So these infants uh, will be assessed first when they go, when you go to the secondary triage using this jumpstart algorithm. So if they're, if they're able to walk, you assess if they're able to, uh, they are able to breathe. So if, sorry, if they're not able to walk, you assess their breathing. If they're not breathing, you position the airway. So if they breathe after you position the airway, then this means they, they are lying, but now they're not able to maintain their airway. So that's your red patients or patients who require immediate intervention. So if they're not, they don't breathe even after opening the airway, you check for a pulse. So if they don't have a pulse, then you tag them as black, those are diseased. But then if they open, you open their airway, but they're not breathing, but they have a pulse, this is where you perform, you give them the five rescue breaths. So if, if, if after even the five rescue breaths, uh, they are still not uh, breathing, then you tag them as black. So, but if you have given your five rescue breaths and they are breathing, then those are your red patients and they need immediate um, care and intervention. So if your, your child is uh, breathing, so you're going to assess the respiratory. So uh, as I said, uh, the difference, uh, as opposed to the start triage, we use two, two different rates. So is it less than 15 or above 45? So if re the respiratory is less than 15 or above 45, then these are your red patients and they will need immediate care. So you'll move them to the red uh, area or the red zone. So if these patients, uh, they are breathing, and the rate is between 15 and 45, you go on to check their pulse. So if there's no palpable pulse, then those are your red patients and they will need immediate care. So you go on to assign them to the red zone. So if they have a palpable pulse, you go on to assess the, the response that is a uh, AVPO. So you check if they are alert, um, if they're responding to voice, or uh, if they're pain or if they're unconscious. So if the response at this point is P, um, so this is inappropriate, or they have a posturing or they're unresponsive, then this, they fall into the category of your red patients and you have removed them to the red zone. But if, um, if you have, uh, if they're responding, if they're alert, or they're responding to a uh, voice, um, then this will be your delayed patients. You move them to the yellow. So the other tool that is commonly used is salt. Um, salt uh, commonly uh, refers to sort, assess, give life-saving interventions, 
and then now uh, we triage and treat appropriately. So this approach is similar to the start system, however, it's more comprehensive and uh, there's that addition of the simple life-saving techniques during the triage phase. So some of the life-saving interventions that are um, actually captured in this uh, triage tool include uh, controlling major hemorrhage, opening airway, middle decompression in, in case of um, attention in mother ranks, and auto-injector antidotes should be performed as long as this is not time intensive. So this, this would include patients who are exposed, um, let's say maybe in a CBRN uh, kind of incident. So once performed, the provider should assign a color-coded tag similar to the start free edge and move on to the next patient to ensure the poor flow of patients. So this is the algorithm uh, for your for the salt triage. So as we said, um, the step one, the sorting, the working and then non-working. But now for this, uh, you have, uh, so you assess for those who, you actually ask the patients to, to try and walk. So those who walk, you tell them to walk to a certain place and those one you assess uh, as a third priority. And then you, once you have sorted those who can walk, you ask uh, those who have remained to wave or make a purposeful movement. So if they are able to wave, then you assess them second. But then those who are those who they are those who won't be able to walk, and they will not be able to wave. So those are the the still patients or those who have obvious threats to life. So those are the ones you will go and assess first. So you have done the sorting, that's the step one. Now you go to the assessment. So for the assessment, this is individually. So you said um, you start with the still ones and then those who are you will pull with and then now those who are working. So for the assessment, uh, as you said, the difference uh, between this and the start triage, you is that provision of uh, life-saving intervention like controlling the major hemorrhage, uh, opening the airway. And now even here, they consider um, the pediatric population. So if you have uh, uh, you have opened the airway for a child, you have also to consider the rescue rates. And then now sometimes if you have resources, you can do chest compressions and now the auto-injector auto antidotes. So once you've assessed uh, and you have given uh, that those life-saving interventions, you go on to assess the breathing. So even after these life interven life-saving interventions, if they're not breathing, then you tag them as dead. So those are your black patients. But if they are breathing, um, you go on to assess, are they able to obey command or make uh, purposeful movements? And then you check, you proceed on to assess if they have a pulse, uh, if they're not, uh, you check if they're in respiratory uh, distress or if the major hemorrhage is controlled. If all this, if all this, they're able to obey command, they have a peripheral pulse, they're not in respiratory distress and the major hemorrhage is controlled. If, those, if all this are yes, then you, those are your minor, they, then they have minor injuries, then you tag them as green and they go, they have minimal injuries. So, but then if they have all this and they have, uh, they don't have uh, any injuries that are obvious, um, then those would be your delayed patients or your yellow patients. But then if they are not able, uh, if any of, uh, they're not, it's either they're not able to obey command or they don't have a pulse or they're in respiratory distress or the, the major hemorrhage is not controlled, uh, and yet they are likely to survive given the current resources you have in your facility, then these are your red patients and they need immediate treatment and you transfer them to the immediate uh, treatment zone. But then if any of them, if they didn't achieve any of those, that is they're not able to obey commands or they don't have a peripheral pulse or they don't, they're in respiratory distress or the major hemorrhage is not controlled and yet they are they're not likely to survive uh, given their current resources at your facility, then you will treat these patients uh, as expectant patients. So that's where your salt triage 
And then now you have uh, the sieve, which is commonly used in most of the facilities. So for the sieve, um, they are quite similar um, across board, the triage tools. So for sieve, uh, the step one, you start, you check if your patient is working or not. So if they're working, uh, those are your priority three patients and they go to the green green zone or the delayed uh, treatment area. So if they're not working, you go on to assess their breathing. So if they're not breathing, um, you try opening the airway. So if they're still not breathing, despite you opening the airway, then you tag them as dead. Yeah. Um, so you give them a black tag or a white tag um, in case you're in countries like South Africa. So, but if they are, they have their breathing after an airway maneuver. So those are your priority one patients. That's your red patients, and they need immediate care. So you you transfer them to your red zone. So if the patient is uh, breathing, you you go ahead to check the respiratory. So for this sieve, uh, we use uh, less than 10 or greater than 29. So if uh, the respiratory is less than 10 or greater than 29, then these are your priority one patients. Uh, that's your red, you transfer them to the red zone for the immediate treatment area. So if they are breathing and the respiratory is acceptable, that is in this um, case between 10 and 29, you go on to assess the circulation. So the circulation, uh, you check your, your pulse and your cap refill time. So if the cap refill time is uh, prolonged, that is more than two seconds, but the pulse is more than, more than uh, 120, that's your priority one patients. Those are your red patients and they need immediate uh, treatment. But if you assess their circulation and the cap refill is less than two seconds, but the pulse is less than one, 120, then those, they fall in the yellow category. And um, so they need urgent care, but um, yeah, they can wait a bit longer for you to manage your red patients. This tool, it's systematic uh, yeah, for prioritizing casualties for treatment during a mass casualty incident. Uh, so the triage officer normally uses this uh, process to facilitate prioritization of treatment and patient movement as with all the triage tools that you have checked, tackled even before here. Alternative for the C uh, triage tool in pediatrics, you can use um, the triage tip, uh, commonly known, known as bracelet tip. So this is the child version of the triage tip that uses uh, physiological measures proportional to a child's uh, height that is proportional to their weight and age. So this assures appropriate age assessment. So for this uh, tool, you place a tape next to the patient from the head and an algorithm next to the feet just to treat the child. And the assessment are based on respira respiration, pulse, and ability to walk. So this is an alternative to the sieve. So sieve uh, will be more accurate for adults as opposed to pediatric. So pediatric, you use a triage tape or the Brussels tape. So you have another triage category uh, known as SAVE, uh, that's secondary assessment of victim endpoints. Uh, this was developed to direct uh, limited resources to the subgroup of patients expected to benefit most from their use. That is the resources available in your facility. So it assesses the survivability of patients with various injuries and on the basis of trauma statistics. Uh, and it uses this information to describe the relationship between expected benefits and resources consumed. So this uh, category takes into account even the like pre-existing diseases and age uh, are factored in into this uh, triage uh, tool. So like, for example, for an elderly patient with one to 70% of body surface area uh, is unsalvageable under uh, some uh, conditions and would require the use of significant medical resources, that is both personnel and equipment, that that's such a patient would be treated as an expectant patient and would be uh, moved on to the expectant uh, area. 
But for a young adult with a GCS of like 12, who may require only airway maintenance, would use fewer resources and would have a reasonable um, chance of survival. With the interventions available in the fields or even in the hospital, this would be triage uh, to a treatment area that your red or your yellow zone. So basically, it uses the same uh, concept. So red requires immediate intervention, uh, yellow, um, yeah, requires intervention but can tolerate a brief delay. And then now for your green patients, they do not require intervention to prevent loss of life or limb. So those ones can live when without any intervention from your end. And now for your black patients, those are the dead or um, you cannot salvage them. For the CBRN, um, basically uh, it's the same uh, concept of triage, um, but then here you have uh, chemical exposure. So on top of uh, triaging, like the normal mass casualty triage, uh, the trauma triage, you have to go ahead and uh, assess if they have been affected by this uh, toxin that they've been exposed to. So you start uh, the normal way, the step one, are they walking? Uh, if they are, yes, they are walking. Then you take them to the delayed treatment area, that's your green area. And then now uh, you check for any signs of toxicity. Uh, in this case, depending on the chemical exposure, um, so if they are exposed and they have signs of uh, uh, toxicity, then um, you give them a, a tag a T2. Uh, so yes, they are they require delayed treatment, but the fact that they have been exposed to these chemicals, um, you may require to uh, intervene earlier than your normal uh, non-exposed green patients. So, and then now if they are not working, you check for any signs of uh, life. If uh, you try and stimulate them um, and also perform some airway maneuver to try and open their airway, if despite that they are not able to, uh, to breathe, then you tag them as your black patients. Those are dead, so you don't um, concentrate so much on them in terms of resources. So, but where resources permit, resuscitation will be attempted on cases of uh, weakness respiratory arrest with early use of antidotes. Uh, and that's uh, like atropine for your nerve agents, uh, toxicity, or the application, uh, yeah, for the nerve agent toxicity. So you go on, if they have, uh, if they're able to breathe, you check if they have any catastrophic uh, hemorrhage. If they have, uh, then you apply a tourniquet to try and uh, stop the breathing. Uh, but this, uh, Will uh, those will be tagged as red? So they need uh, immediate uh, intervention, like uh, yeah, the stopping of bleed, of the bleeding, the application of the tourniquet, and probably um, pressure dressing and all that. So if they don't have catastrophic breathing, you go on to assess uh, the respiratory. Uh, if they have any signs of respiratory distress. So if they have, um, you also that would. Uh, be dictated by the respiratory rate. Is it less than 10 or above 30? So if they are, they fall into this category, that is um, the respiratory is less than 10 or more than 30, uh, then you, these are your red patients and they require immediate treatment. So they are tagged as red. So if they are not in respiratory distress, you check if they are unconscious or they are fitting. Um, so if they're not unconscious and they're not fitting, then um, this will, uh, they are urgent, but then um, they can afford to wait a little bit longer for you to manage your um, your red patients. But then if they, are, they have this urgent uh, criteria, uh, they fall into the urgent category, but they have signs of toxicity, then um, automatically they become red patients since you need to um, try and uh, decontaminate them so that uh, you don't they don't uh, succumb from their injuries and also the exposure to the chemicals they have. So some of the signs of toxicity you have to check depending on the exposure. Now for those who are, have chemical exposure, you have to check for do they have confusion, 
uh, cyanosis, excessive secretions, uh, and also now the heart rate are less than 40. Uh, and uh, yeah, you've monitored uh, non thermal bands. And then now for your biological, those who have been exposed to biological substances, you check their temperature, is it above 39 as they are having a fever? Do they have a rash? Are they confused or they have reduced BCS score? Uh, those who have had uh, exposure to radiation or nuclear energy. So the dose you can estimate maybe uh, from the from the material they were exposed to. If, uh, and then the, if they have vomiting with or without diarrhea or erythema, then these are some of the signs that will actually tell you that this patient uh, has actually been exposed to these chemicals. So these are, uh, this is the only uh, available tool as it, as it stands uh, that takes into consideration con contamination and the toxidrome that occurs from chemical exposure. We have gone through the, the various triage tools and the importance of triage in a mass casualty. But now how do we implement this in our various facilities? So we have to come up uh, with plans and make sure we have sufficient uh, preparation so that when we are faced with such uh, scenarios, then uh, we are able to respond and manage this patient effectively. So now for your preparedness, uh, some of the things you can do, you can agree uh, as um, a facility or, or a department who will be mostly involved in the, the MCI. Uh, you can agree on which chair system to be used uh, for surge, during a surge. That is, you have those MCI uh, victims coming into your facility, and then you identify a location for step one triage during an MCI. That is the first step. That is where you um, actually differentiating your working patient and the non-working patients, and then ensure that all staff understand. Uh, the utilitarian necessity of MCA triage. So it has to be simple and understood and um, uh, able to guide you on how to treat these patients who come into your facility. And then you have to ensure for preparedness also, you ensure that the relevant staff members, they are trained in triage techniques. That is a triage technique that you have uh, selected as a facility to use during an MCI. And the other thing you have to identify is the members of staff which will conduct the step one triage. Those are the, the first contact uh, with these uh, patients, with these uh, victims of an MCI. Uh, the other thing you have to put into consideration is the equipment and materials for conducting the step two triage uh, and make sure they are readily available. So this, this is um, after the first step, now for your uh, red patients, um, the yellow patients uh, that you have them and uh, whatever is required, even during inter intervention, you have it. So some of the things you can do uh, in such a case is uh, just make sure you have monitors that can help you uh, maybe take our blood pressure, our pulse rates, uh, and all that. So some of the, let's say now you have uh, these patients coming into your facility. So what are you supposed to do? So the assumption, or the basic um, assumption, or actually the expectation is that you have, you actually have a plan. You have an MCA plan on how to manage these patients who will come in after a mass casualty incident. So what is expected of you, uh, you're supposed to conduct the step one triage in the previously identified location. So this has to be predetermined. Uh, you don't determine uh, a triage location when you already have patients. So this has to be uh, pre-planned, predetermined, and also if you have to uh, drill, you have to do this so that people are aware of where this will take place. And then ensure identified staff comments, uh, the staff one triage and step two triage, and appropriately equipped in predetermined areas of the health facility. So this is uh, this basically means uh, where where these two different triages are taking place, and even after the step one triage, where are you taking your patients, like your red patients, your yellow patients, your green patients? 
So this has to be clear and uh, predefined pre even before you, you actually have an MCI or for you to be able to respond appro appropriately. So some of the tips uh, for setting up and implementing these uh, 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 triage uh, methods. So the triage categories, uh, they're not considered rigid. And there are many times where one patient may fall between two triage categories. But in this case, in such a scenario, the patient should be class classified with the highest priority between the two categories. Let's say you're not sure if a patient is uh, green or yellow. I always give them um, a yellow tag, like a higher uh, tag where at least they will be able to be seen earlier. And then ensure all staff, uh, your staff is aware of the shared system in use at any given time. And here, uh, the importance of constant um, drills, uh, maybe tabletop training, and also going through your plan comes in. And then ensure all unresponsive patients even those presumed dead should be triaged as non-working. So this will uh, come in, in handy when you actually, um, during accountability of the patient who you received in your facility at any given point. So and then for special consideration, so these are the questions you should be asking yourself after this lecture, like in my facility, where, where is the appropriate place to set up a, a step one triage point. That is where you're differentiating between your working and the non-working patients. And then who should be the step one triage officer? Who, who are your triage officers? And then after st step two triage, where should your yellow patients be sent? And where should your blue patients, that's your expectant patients be sent? For this uh, triage, uh, this both step one and step two, um, you should uh, fully apply to the deployed emergency medical teams dealing with an MCI. But if any patients are beyond, depending on your facility and capability, make sure you transfer uh, appropriately and early so that these patients are able to uh, obtain appropriate care so in a timely fashion. So we'll go to the clinic for zone. So we have triaged our patients, you have your red, um, your yellow, uh, your green, and your black patients. So you have, uh, it's an expectation um, after this uh, lecture that you'd have this in your facility, like you know where these zones will be. So for the red zone, um, so irrespective of the triage system in place, so patients with minor injuries should be excluded from the emergency unit. So that's, those are your working patients, the ones you have triaged green, so, but which must be reserved for moderate. Uh, so the emergency units should be reserved for moderate and the severe cases. That's the red and the yellow patients. So this means that uh, all or part of the emergency unit should be repurposed to become the non-working zone, otherwise referred to as a red zone. And separate triage performed within this zone will further categorize now your patients to red, yellow, or blue depending on um, their parameters, their triage parameters. The subcategories after now, the secondary triage of the patients in the red zone. So you have uh, those patients, that immediate group of patients in need of resuscitation and immediate life and limb saving interventions. Those will be your red um, or priority one patients. And then you have your patients who you'll uh, triage as yellow or priority two. So these are uh, patients who are assessed as requiring treatment but who can wait and could be moved to another part of the health facility. And then you have those patients that are assessed as expectants because the care they require is above the current uh, available resources and they should be moved to a specific care area away from the main clinical area where they can be given palliative care and be regularly assessed. But um, if you have, uh, if resources levels improve, these patients may change from the expectant to immediate resuscitation. So it all depends with whatever resources you have in your facility at that point in time. For your dead patient, for, sorry, for your black patients, those are the dead patients. They should be moved to the MOC as soon as possible or a predetermined location where, where you have said it will be a makeshift MOC during an MCI. So some of the things that are expected for you to do uh, for your red patient 
you have to control uh, hemorrhage uh, for the catastrophic bleeding. You either ap apply direct pressure or a tourniquet and uh, for the airway, uh, you can open the airway and ensure it's clear. Uh, so you may need to um, um, suction, put in your airway adjuncts or even intubate at this point. And then breathing, um, if you're not breathing, um, you may consider uh, doing chest compressions, but this totally depends on uh, whether you have enough resources. And uh, you can also do the chest decompression. Yeah, the during a like a, for patients with tension pneumothorax or even uh, massive hemonymo. And also at this point, you can give them oxygen. So for the circulation, you you're required or expected to assess and treat for shock, immobilize fractions. So remember all these patients, they come in pain. So you have to remember to give them pain meds. Uh, those with wounds, uh, give them tetanus. And if you're able to do some point of care testing, um, maybe you have portable x-rays or any other things that you may be able to do in your emergency department, you can do them at this point. And then now after you do this um, resuscitation, you can now reassess and recharge them. And uh, you can allocate them to the different um, triage categories, depending on uh, their parameters. So some of the um, things that are expected for you to do in your facility now after learning about uh, these patients in the red zone, so you need to decide um, how the emergency unit will be converted to be used at the red zone. So, and you identify the necessary supplies and equipment for the creation of the red zone. So the red zone, so you know which kind of patients uh, you're expecting, for what kind of injuries. So you know what kind of resources which you can um, pre-organize or preset or make sure you have during um, a mass casualty incident for the, for the management of these patients. Um, so during response, let's say you have an actual mass casualty uh, uh, incident or even uh, during a drill. So you have to identify and safely relocate if possible your existing um, emergency unit patients. So remember um, MCI, they are just emergencies. No one knows when they happen. So remember you still have your regular patients in your ED. So you need to think about, if in case of an MCI, where will I take these patients? Where will they um, be treated for continuity of care? And then um, you give cl clinical treatment as indicated, and then you go on to your step two triage. So it's important that you have immediate uh, evacuation um, of the emergency unit before, um, before you first, in case you're aware of a mass casualty incident happening. So even before the first uh, patient arrives, it's important to evacuate so that you have enough space to receive these new patients. And then, so you'll consider, sometimes you may consider the protocol for evacuation in case of fire inside the emergency unit, and you can adopt this to the MCI protocol. So this depends with uh, what your facility has. So, and then uh, managing staff in the red zone requires a coordinated and pre-agreed approach. So different uh, approach options are available. So some of the examples, you have a pit stop approach where each team is assigned a bed and waits for its patient to arrive. So, and then once stabilized, the patient is moved to his or her final destination and the team waits for the next patient. Or you can have uh, the mobile team approach uh, where each team starts in an occupied bed. So you have a patient in a, in a bed. So you go to that patient and then once stabilized, the patient is moved to his or her final destination and the team moves to the next occupied bed. So this approach may be better suited, uh, especially for low resource setting as the number of patients arriving may quickly overwhelm uh, the number of available teams. And then regardless of the chosen approach, Whenever patients continue uh, entering the red zone and there are no team is immediately available to manage them, it's a good practice to assign someone to prioritize these new patients, ensuring that the staff, uh, the first available team 
we take the most serious um, patient first. So some of the um, special consideration um, uh, is, is that a nearby area where you can place the patients being evacuated from the emergency unit. So these are the alternative sites for your regular um, emergency unit patients. So this would be a transfer area where patients would be collected by staff from other departments. And then what kind of procedures would you undertake in the red zone? So this basically helps you to prepare in terms of resources you need to stock in your department in the red zone for the management of these patients. And then how should the clinical lead prioritize patients for theater or ICU? So who goes first? And then who is responsible to assemble teams of doctors and nurses in the red zone? Basically, um, this would be your coordination team. Who is your coordination team? So this will depend with your departmental and the hospital protocols. And what additional training would you require for the medical teams working in the red zone? And what is the plan with caring for non-working patients who may be discharged from the emergency unit due to injuries that do not require any kind of surgical intervention? So you need to think about this. So where will these patients be discharged from? Since you know you have limitations in terms of space, so do you still want to keep these patients in your unit or is there somewhere an alternative area where the discharge process can happen. So for those patients in the green zone, <clears throat> so you have to remember that irrespective of the shared system, there must be a green zone for managing the working patients. The functions of this zone is basically to provide uh, clinical care to patients with a higher likelihood of uh, non-time critical and non-life-threatening injuries. So these patients can manage even you, uh, they can actually um, survive without you uh, intervening. And then the green zone should be adjacent to, but distinct from the health facilities emergency unit. Um, so in many mass casualty situations, um, the green patients are likely to be most of the cohort, which is therefore preferable to have a designated space, ideally outside the emergency unit to accommodate them. Um, and then in low or middle resource setting, you may consider setting up a tent, a temporary shelter where you can actually host this uh, patient. So you have to remember that uh, the green patient, the, there must be an awareness that the condition of a patient in the green zone can rapidly deteriorate, necessitating emergency intervention. So there should therefore be at least one experienced clinical staff member available for the green zone. So they're able to pick up such patients. And because of this, the green zone should be uh, located as to ensure the rapid transfer of patients to triage as uh, immediate. So this is basically to mean that uh, uh, the green zone should not be so far from your red zone, uh, just in case a patient changes condition and you need immediate uh, transfer to a red zone. So it should not be so far off. So in terms of implementation, why this is important. So you need... Uh, as a facility, you need to decide where and how the green zone will be established. And then designate staff who will work in the green zone uh, and who will identify the necessary supplies and the equipment for the creation of the green zone. So let's say you have uh, an MCI, uh, is an MCI and you have your green patients. So how are you expected to respond? So you should de deploy the designated staff to the green zone. So this will uh, depend with your MCA plan as an organization. And then um, you conduct clinical treatment as indicated and uh, ensure continuous clinical observation in order to detect a possible deterioration in patient condition necessitating a recategorization of the patient. So some of the implementation tips um, in order to ensure the patients in the green zone keep flowing, different approaches can be put into Place examples can be a conveyor belt approach where the patients entering the green zone move from one treatment uh, station to, to another until they, they are discharged. So, example, um, you can have um, okay, a place where you're triaging will happen, uh, wound dressing, uh, ENT examination, orthopedic examination, psychosocial support, oxygen therapy, and a discharge station. So that, that ensures that uh, there's a smooth flow and uh, you don't have overcrowding of this patient. Remember, these are the most patients uh, during an MCI. So, or you can use the mobile team approach where patients are assessed by clinical providers 
that move from patient to patient until all patients are assessed, treated, and discharged. So, uh, so you consider an approach that will help to quickly move the patients and discharge them and ensure follow up. So some of the special consideration for your green zone. Uh, so you need to consider what kind of procedures would be undertaken in a green zone. This will help you to um, plan on the resources you need for the, these patients or this green zone. And then where should the green zone be placed on the hospital grounds? So this should be predetermined, don't wait for a drill or an MCI to happen for you to determine this. Who should be allowed inside the green zone? And then a patient in the green zone is suddenly deteriorating and becomes unconscious. What are the necessary steps to get him or her into the red zone? Uh, and then in your context, who should be staff in the green zone uh, or, and is that dependent on the hour of the day? So these are the considerations you should have as a, as a unit, as an organization or a department. And then um, so some of the special considerations are for your emergency medical teams. So despite the space limitations, clinical zones um, are fully applicable to deployed uh, emergency medical teams. teams. And in most cases, the green zone will have to be treated outside of the main facility, uh, probably possibly in an expansion area. So in summary, uh, we've gone through um, MCA triage, uh, and we have said it ad adopts a simplified uh, approach in order to maximize the impact of limited resources on the patient outcomes. And then uh, you have to remember uh, repeated assessment is vital to monitor, especially patients who may uh, who are prone to deterioration so that we can um, manage them appropriately and uh, as soon as we can. Some of the reference, most of the reference um, material is from mass casualty management in the WHO Academy. And I think that's the end of my presentation. I don't Thank you very much, Grace. A uh, couple of questions in the... Q&A, so uh, what do you mean by the auto-injector antidote? I think that's what that was meant. Okay, so these are uh, antidote depending. So uh, I believe you're talking about patients who have toxicity after CBRN, uh, CBRN uh, exposure. So those are the possible anti antidotes. Uh, depending on the chemical that the patient has been exposed to. So if you have uh, such kind of uh, antidotes in your facility, you can use them. Are they locally available? No, uh, no. But uh, we are hoping that this audience could be working from anywhere in this world. So that's why it right, happens. Man. Essentially, it's the same drugs that come in a vial. If it's atropine, it's atropine. There's nothing special about it. Uh, so it's just pre-filled syringes. Uh, that's what the antidotes are. All right. What's the usage of triage tools such as new score in MCI? So, uh, hmm. so those they're not very uh, useful, but it depends on the number of uh, patients you have. So this may be useful for your green patients. Uh, those are the no the patients are not very those you can actually take time with. So sometimes you may apply them for those, uh, your green patients, but otherwise for your red patients, you don't uh, a triage tool that will take you uh, so much time uh, to assess a patient uh, rather than intervening, but you can use them for your green patients, those who have an advantage of a bit of time. Um, there's another question around how do does a clinician protect themselves from, I think it's, uh, it says NBCN or it's CBRN, I guess, uh, even as one does triage. Okay, uh, so this uh, will have, uh, so there are protocols, but this should have to have be predetermined uh, in your facility. So there are those things you should have um, the gum boots, um, the mask, uh, the aprons. And also in case of a CBRN, you have to have a designated um, area where the contamination will actually 
happen before you actually start treating this patient so that you don't um, expose yourself or your colleagues or other patients to the CBRN um, chemicals. So you have to have planned as a hospital, as a facility on what you require uh, for such incidences and they have to be readily available when such an incident happens. I think it's the same questions that are coming up. I think the biggest question is, how do you plan? Like what, what do you need to do to plan? Um, we've discussed what needs to be done, but how do you go around planning? Uh, so we've gone through the triage, uh, the triage tools and the methods and the kind of patients you expect. So you just need to go back to our facility, uh, see what you have, um, how are our EDs, because most of the time this is where uh, we have, we receive these uh, victims from a mass casualty incident. And then, so you need to sit down as a facility, as a department, and see when this uh, incident happens, like um, you can start, uh, since you all have, a, uh, you're more aware of your department than I, I don't know where you guys work, but uh, see where you can put up some of these things, some of these areas, like where can we do this triage, not so far away from uh, uh, the emergency department, uh, but also not in the emergency department. So it's you as a facility, as a department, to just go into your facility and see um, how your ED is and how you can actually uh, plan on how you can respond to these patients. And then now uh, you come up, you have to come up with a plan of uh, after you identify all these areas like you where you um, you do the triage, the resources you require, and what maybe you may need to have uh, uh, to have before an MCI happens. So you need to write it down, and then you you have to practice on it. So you need to uh, make your staff aware of it by continuous training. Uh, it could be tabletop, you can also do drills. But, uh, and then now, uh, even after the drills, that could help you come up with a better plan since you see some, you may identify some of the gaps um, depending on your pre-existing plan. But yeah, the starting point is you have to now sit down and um, depending on how your ED is, uh, come up with some of these things. Right. I see some additional comments on the chat from Bovim Tua. Planning for an MCI, I believe it starts with preparation. Yes. What resources do you have in hand to help with an MCI? And then have an all hazard plan for your facility, more of a mass preparedness plan for your hospital. And then there's need to get funding for MCIs as most casualties will not be able to pay for the services um, that you will provide at the time. Holding drills to assess your MCI plan at least annually. Any comments on that? No, I think um, that's a good uh, way of handling it too, of approaching it. Right. So I think this goes back to the definition because someone has asked, can cholera outbreak be regarded as an MCI? So maybe as you answer that one, then, then what is regarded as an MCI? Okay. So an MCI is uh, where you have uh, your number of uh, the casualties who are alive, that is who needs um intervention, who need treatment, actually overwhelm your resources in terms of, uh, could be space, it could be um, uh, the resources, like uh, maybe the staff who need to manage these patients or even the staff who are required to manage these patients. So so yeah, a cholera out outbreak can be an MCI depending on the number of patients who are arriving at your facility at a certain point in time. All right, I think I just maybe want to add to that so a lot of, just to add on what Dr. Grace has mentioned, is an MCI easily, it has to do with what she's mentioned, live casualties and available resources. If you have, for example, if you are in a facility that doesn't regulate, doesn't intubate patients and you receive even 10 patients who need intubation, uh, you probably are having a minor MCI over there. So this is where, again, or for example, you, you are in a facility that doesn't handle burns patients and you receive multiple burns patients, then again. Um, so yes, there is the 
number of patients, but it's a factor of number of patients, severity. So for example, if you received 20 patients who are just complaining of a bit of a headache, yeah, there are many, but there's nothing, they don't need much resources. So it's a combination of that. So, and that's why an MCI in one hospital may not be necessarily an MCI in another facility based on available resources. I think the questions on CPD points will be answered. The video presentation will be available. You can get it, you can note it there. And question is, are there organizations that can help an institution conduct a drill on MCI? Yeah, uh, but uh, most of the time, yeah, you actually, um, you can invite them to be observers and then they can give you feedback. But, uh, but also if you need guidance, yes, we are, here, even as EMKF, we can guide on how you can go through it. But yeah, for in case you, you're conducting um, an MCI or you want to do a drill on it, there are various organizations who are very um, well conversant with it, even in the government, uh, in NGOs, who you can uh, just call to give you some insights on how you can go about it and even um, give you feedback on how you performed as an organization. Yeah, and I think I think a lot add to that is the there are multiple steps. I know that Grace captured this. Um, first part is coming up with a plan. Then after you've come up with a plan, you do small level drills like tabletop drills or tabletop exercises, um, and fix what needs to be fixed before rolling out a hospital-wide uh, drill. Uh, we've seen periodically uh, people just automatic, just waking up and running hospital-wide drills without any plan and without, yeah, this is, and we've seen disasters that have taken up, have happened from that. So before you run a drill, a physical drill, make sure you at least have a plan. Everyone knows a plan. You've done a bit of tabletop exercises and discussions within the teams to and walk around with the team so drill it internally in on paper and um with the teams before you conduct a big drill it is no use running a drill to just to prove that you can't handle it or you can handle it um planning is key let me see if there's an additional um and then in terms of command at hospital level, who is the incident commander downwards? Uh, how are these roles designed and things like that? The incident command system. So this will depend with uh, with your organization, uh, how you set it up. But most of the time, um, it could be someone um, in charge, someone who is able to access uh, most or all of the departments, like a duty manager of sorts. Um, but it, it also depends with what you have in your plan. Uh, you need to come up with a plan and uh, actually identify who, who it's, a, it's a position, like who, who will occupy that position. So they're in charge and then now they have the uh, lower levels of uh, people who help in the, in the operations. All right. In terms of the roles, yes. Uh, so the roles are not people dependent. Uh, you can't say the CEO will be um, the incident commander. Uh, what if the CEO is on holiday? So normally, as you design your organogram um, or your response, your incident command structure, you need to think about it as what roles need to be done and who would be available. Um, I always say plan to plan for a mass casualty event on a Sunday night. Who is on duty? Who can be called? If your if your plan can function on a Sunday night, it can function on any other day. So as you look at how you develop your plans, um, develop a plan that can work at Sunday midnight. Yes, if your plan can work Sunday midnight, then you have a good plan. I uh, see Mbuvi has commented. That yes, there are institutions that can help assessors as assessors uh, to your drill. Example, Ministry of Health. National Disaster Management Unit, the government chemists, especially for CBRN preparedness, uh, find out your stakeholders around you and those who can help in times of need. They also need to have MOUs with uh, multiple stakeholders and uh, they should also know your plan thoroughly. Okay, good point. 
Um, I'm not seeing any other questions unless Grace, you have any more comments. Um, thank you for tuning in. All right. I think maybe my question that before I ask, before I let you go, okay, she disappeared. I don't know if she's gone yet. Is you a lot of the tools you've mentioned, are they pre-hospital tools or are they in-hospital tools? The jump start, the start triage tools, are these tools designed or validated for in-hospital use or just pre-hospital use? So they can uh, be used for both. Okay. All right. Um, so because we'll discuss next week a lot of the pre-hospital triage and some of the tools, yes, are being used. So we'll see the validation behind some of the tools and how they work. But thank you very much for a great presentation.